specific case is real. And I agree with Ed Hem. There is no contradiction between nationalism and cosmopolitan, which itself is a very protean word. And one shining example is Mustafa Kemal, the most nationalist, apparently, uh, leader of Turkey. But he was also, he spoke French. He introduced foreign laws. He was from Salonika. Um, and I'm talking about Izmir, the great port on the Aegean, which was one of the main uh, trading ports of the Mediterranean from the early 17th century. By 1900, I believe 55% of exports of the Ottoman Empire went through Izmir. And here we have a picture which appears to represent the city. It's a sort of strip cartoon. This is the port. This is the city of Izmir, m many minarets. You see the warehouses on the uh, waterfront. And here below is the renewal of capitulations between the Kadi and a Dutch consul. I think it is Monsieur de Hospier in 1723. It is a ceremony, a sort of uh, consular version of the great ambassadorial of uh, receptions of ambassadors in Istanbul by the Sultan with uh, where large numbers of foreigners are incorporated in an Ottoman ceremony. And you see um, uh, in the background foreign flags, these great foreign flags which everyone writes about as flying from consuls' residences on the waterfront. So this appears to be an international city. Izmir had Venetian, Dutch, English, and French consuls. They had their own janissary guards. They kept open house. They themselves were merchants. Often they were writers uh, describing what they saw, like Paul Rico, who was British uh, English consul in Izmir in the 1670s, author of Histories of the Ottoman Empire. And Evlia Celebi, when he goes to Izmir in the 1670s, he is impressed by the power of the consuls. If someone hits an infidel, everyone immediately surrounds him and brings him to the consular judge, or the infidels execute him. At that time, the Muslim people become invisible, so that at this time it seems a dark, frank place. Um, and uh, here is uh, the capitulations which help govern uh, much trade in uh, Izmir. And this is another ceremony you see. It's a, a favorite subject for artists. Uh, this is a French consul. And you see he's claiming equality of status, wearing a hat and sitting down, not standing, with I Izmir in the background. Um, and the power of the consuls, which was one of the defining factors of these uh, cities, it wasn't just um, national, it also it could operate to preserve the city. Uh, 28th of April, 1694, for example, um, of the Venetian fleet is threatening Izmir, but the French consul comes out from Izmir and persuades the uh, Venetian admiral not to attack the city, and thereby to avoid uh, massacre and plunder and uh, the most important thing of all, loss of or interruption of trade. And the same phenomenon occurs in 1770 when the Russian fleet is threatening um, uh, Izmir and uh, the consuls come out and persuade the admiral not to attack it during the Russo-Turkish War of that time. <coughs> Here's another picture showing uh, the large number of foreign boats in the port of Izmir. Uh, it's Dutch, uh, late 17th century. And here is another picture in the Musée de la Marine in um, Paris where you see a French admiral who is visiting Izmir and paying his respects to Ottoman authorities. Again, it's a bit like a 
strip cartoon and the French are incorporated in an Ottoman procession. And we have the Admiral's account of his visit to the Empire, uh, Admiral de Beaufremont, it's 1768, and he's presenting the Empire as uh, on the brink of collapse, and he says everybody hates the Sultan. Of course, it's the French monarchy which was about to collapse, the Ottoman Empire went on. And here is another picture, 1770, Antoine de Favre, and it all appears very cosmopolitan. It is a Dutch merchant, Mr. Van Lennep, who has arrived in the city earlier in the century. That is his father-in-law in, -law in uh, a version of local dress, who was a merchant in Ankara, his wife and children, all of whom marry um, somebody of another nationality, French, British, or Swiss. Um, and this, and here you see the key later in the 19th century, and it was said that uh, if Izmir is the eye of Asia, the cordon or key is the pupil of the eye. And um, there are many descriptions by Turkish and uh, foreign visitors of the key and the music played in the cafes, the international trade. And I will quote, um, and, and of course, Izmir had become uh, a great center of immigration. Greeks, after Greek independence, they leave Greece, preferring to many Greeks, preferring to uh, work in Izmir. Uh, by the 19th century, of the population of about 130,000 was approximately uh, over 50,000 Greeks, 13,000 Jews, 12,000 Franks, 5,000 Armenians, and 45,000 Turks. And that is when it is called Javur Izmir, or um, infidel Izmir, and uh, two imperial visits appear to confirm the uh, international nature of the city. June 1850, Sultan Abdul Mejid visits the city and he uh, visits not only the local authorities, but also an Armenian Catholic banker called Jean Papazian Effendi and the banker Georges Baltazzi in their villas in Bornova, the Baltazzis who were among the richest uh, inhabitants of the city. 21st to 24th of April, 1863, his brother, Sultan Abdulaziz, returning from a visit to Egypt, visits Izmir. Uh, he visits the house of Charlton Whittle, one of the richest English merchants of the city. He's presented with the keys of the house by two young uh, Mrs. Whittles wearing Turkish dress, and um, at his own request, he then visits St. Mary Magdalene Church nearby. And that evening, the Kaptan Pasha gave a dinner on board his yacht, at which Muslim guests alternated with non-Muslims around the table and Turkish dishes with European ones. N next, there are visits to a mosque and then to the races organized by the Smyrna Jockey Club. Um, and the city goes on. There are more foreign schools, uh, more um, Yes, the percentage of Ottoman international trade going through the city rises from 7.5% to 30% in 1873 and 55% uh, in 1900. And uh, this cordon, which is lined with warehouses and cafes, a musician in one of the cafes on the cordon, Papazolu, remembered, we had to know a song or two from each nationality to please the customers. We play Jewish and Armenian and Arab music. We were citizens of the world, you see. And this uh, living together of nationalities persists even, uh, most extraordinarily, in the First World War. Um, here you see the governor, Vali Rahmi Bey, who is with some French merchants of the city, the Giffre family, 
and on the left is a French officer, a prisoner of war, released on parole. Uh, in other cities, there is devastation, not at that time in Izmir. Um, he was known as the King of Smyrna, according to the German consul, Herr Humbert, who wrote his memoirs. Uh, he was in close contact with the French and British families of Smyrna, and he also visited Armenian organizations. He allowed French and British citizens to stay in the city, and in fact, one British company, uh, the Giro, they uh, passed the First World War making uniforms for the Turkish army. They thought it was their patriotic duty to keep their share of the market. And one nurse in uh, the city who wrote a diary says he's quite sweet to all of us here. And uh, so you see Izmir as a law to itself. That's one version of events. But there's also another version. At the same time, and this is uh, really these concepts like nationalism and um, cosmopolitanism, they depend not only on communities and uh, the basic structure of society, but also on events, wars, uh, peace, and individuals like Bali Rahmi Bey. Um, in 1770, for example, um, in the 1670s, Antoine Galland lit visits Smyrna, he writes an account of it, and he says that only the rigor of the laws keeps the people from massacring each other. This hatred between communities is so deep. 7th of July, 1770, while this Russian fleet is nearby, uh, the Battle of Chesme is, is very near to Izmir, um, there are outbursts in uh, Izmir and many thousands of Greeks are killed and many local inhabitants take refuge on ships in the harbor. That is the standard Izmir practice during troubles. You go down to the harbor and you go onto foreign ships. Um, and 1821, the same thing, you know, the beginning of the War of Greek Independence. Uh, uh, 1797, there is a, a fire in the city started by some Janissaries after a riot. A southerly wind helps the fire spread in the Frank Greek and Armenian quarters. All you heard on all sides, according to the uh, Imperial Consul General, were the sounds of gunfire accompanied by terrible shouts, which with the awful cries of the dying and wounded formed an atrocious scene. Again, uh, inhabitants take refuge on foreign boats in the harbor. 1821, outbreak of the Greek War of Independence, some local Greeks congratulate themselves on uh, the, the impending liberation from the Ottoman yoke. And they restore, uh, there will be a race of princes restored to the throne and possession of Constantinople. Again, um, much of the Christian population takes refuge on um, ships. And late 19th century, of course, as in other cities and areas and other countries, not just the Ottoman Empire, but the Austrian Empire, the Russian Empire, nationalism gets more of a grip on hearts and minds. Uh, the local Greek athletic clubs are seats of nationality. Uh, the Austrian consul general uh, thinks that the Greeks are going to take over Smyrna imminently. Um, and Greek community action is beginning uh, 1890. They shut the churches. There's actually a Greek demonstration outside the Kodak. Uh, 1897, an Ottoman Greek war. Many Greeks from Smyrna volunteer to go and fight in the Greek army. And the balance is uh, further changed by the arrival of Muslim Cretan refugees after 1897 in the city. Um, 
and many contemporaries begin that more than the Balkan Wars of 1912 as the beginning of the uh, end of some sort of balance which had existed before. And a symptom of growing, growing tension between communities is the growing number of kidnappings of merchants of the city by bandits uh, in the hinterland. 16th of March 1907, for example, a rich Dutch landowner and tobacco merchant called Baron van Himstra is kidnapped. And these kidnappings are constantly um, going on. And there's many attempts by the Dutch, by consuls, to get the Ottoman government to provide compensation. So you see this balance between uh, tolerance or cosmopolitanism and nationalism is, is a constant seesaw, depending very largely on outside events. And the beginning of the end was, of course, the first after the First World War. Uh, that is Latifa Hanum, the future wife of Mustafa Kemal, who had been partly educated at a French language school in um, Izmir and whose whose father was a prominent merchant of the city. Here you see the form of the European exploitation or employment uh, of the, in the fig industry. Turkish women are sorting figs below a European merchant. And the beginning of the end was the um, arrival of the Greek army, 15th of May, 1919, under the protection of British ships. Lloyd George hoped for a new Greek empire in the east, friendly to Britain. Venizelos, the Greek prime minister, said, Greece can only find her real future from the moment when she is astride the Aegean. There is a hope that um, Greece will be on two continents and washed by five seas. And as the Greek army lands, there is bloodshed, uh, the killing of Turkish troops. Um, and this is probably the single biggest recruiting agent for Mustafa Kemal in Anatolia, more than the foreign occupation of Constantinople or the defeat. It is the arrival of the Greek army in Izmir. Without it, he later said, Turks might have gone on, and I quote, sleeping. And there is uh, a Greek administration from 1920, and it is um, then 1922, 9th of September, Kamal's army enters the city, and then there is the massacre, fire, destruction of a third of the city. And this is a picture painted by a classic international uh, citizen of Izmir, Ovide Kurtovich, an unknown artist, Dalmatian origin, educated in um, Vienna. And he painted many scenes. And uh, this is his last known picture of Izmir as the city goes up in flames. One of the very first cities to be destroyed in the 20th century, a portent of other city destructions. So I think we, we have to see nationalism and cosmopolitanism or internationalism as two sides of the same coin. As cities can change very rapidly indeed, as individuals can have both aspects in their own characters. So can cities. It's, it's happening as we speak in Aleppo after 400 years of living together. Uh, the city is being shredded by different forces. So maybe these concepts of, of we should always remember that these concepts are very flexible and very changeable. Thank you very much.